I will just add, uh, we don't want the church run by theologians, but it is good to have people who have studied and have experience. And this is where Ellen White counseled that if you think you have some new light, quote, go to the brethren of experience. And so probably today, we would at least view some of our professional theologians like me as some of those brethren of experience, as well as some pastors and so forth. Um, and then she kind of counseled, if you just can't convince them there's light in your position, uh, you don't have to refute it, but just lay low. Because if it's of the Lord's doing, eventually he'll keep raising up uh, until finally we get it, you know, kind of a thing. And so I think there's some, uh, a little bit of background that I may not fully capture here in, in these comments, but... Uh, uh, that is the idea is uh, when we have had pastors who think that they aren't getting it, agreeing or something, we try to get a, some kind of group together of peers and scholars where we can uh, take care of this instead of afflicting local congregations with it. So, All righty. Why the Trinity Matters, part three. Let's pray since we've had a little while. Uh, and go from there. Lord, we thank you for this day, for the sunshine outside. Uh, we thank you for uh, at least everybody here, I think, made it through the storms without significant problem. And so continue to guide us and direct us and open our minds as we stretch our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. <clears throat> Some challenging text. Uh, three major tracks. I'm going to go back to the only begotten business and review and deepen on that one. Um, the charge is, in fact, our anti-Trinitarians will quote Psalm 2, verse 7, as you are my son today, I have begotten you, as biblical support for this eternity past begetting. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at ganao, the verb for begetting that we've already talked about uh, in Psalm 2 and Proverbs 8 and a handful of other texts. So let's go back to monogenes. Um, try one more. Anti-Trinitarians are heavily influenced by the King James translation, only begotten, which of course, is that my empty body? I'll go ahead and <clears throat> doesn't hurt to have it nearby. Um, they are influenced by this. The King James, of course, was translated off of the so-called Textus Receptus document. Which the Textus Receptus had heavy influence from Jerome's Vulgate. <coughs> um, even though it was a Greek text, it's, um, you know, later manuscripts and so forth, and Erasmus tries to pull it together. And church tradition has its impact. And so out of the Texas Recepsis, I, I think that just says monogenes because it's Greek. But everybody follows Jerome's influence on the English side and goes with only begotten. And so uh, at this point, the depth of thinking, only begotten, we're just used to hearing it and don't, don't ask questions, you know, too much, especially at the layperson level. So, the anti-Trinitarians assert that monogenes is a compound, see if I can find myself here, of mono, which is alone or one, right? You know, mono rail has one rail <coughs> versus two, two rail. And the verb ganao to be, beget, but it's not defendable. Uh, the actual roots, of course, are the prefix mono, but it actually comes from the verb ginomai to become, it's out of genomai that we get genus or genus, a kind. And so monogenes in Greek is very literalistically one of a kind. One of a kind. One of a genus. And this is why the Latin picked the single word unique, unicus. Unique. Nothing else like it uh, this way. And so the second point then is you take this two-word English translation only begotten, 
and they focus on the begotten half of the text instead of the only half of the text and, uh, and run it from there. And so uh, this is what I answered earlier. Based partly on John 3.16 that you must believe, they tr treat John 3.16 and 18 as teaching them that you have to believe in the begottenness of the Son to be saved. Okay. So that if you're saying, in other words, human begetting isn't enough. It's the eternal back begotten that makes him the Son and the human is just an addition. And so they interpret this text to mean that you must believe that Jesus was begotten as the Son way back there somewhere. And if you believe that sonship, then you'll have everlasting life. And so if you're denying that sonship and accepting the sonship only at the human level here, then you're lost and they're concerned. And so this is what I have run into is that they believe that we're denying the son. Now, by way of review from this morning, again, every monogenes in the New Testament in the Old Latin pre-Jerome is with Eunuchus, which is again, uh, unique in English, literally in Latin, the alone or the sole or the unique. And again, it's Jerome who modifies monogenes only in reference to Christ. Why doesn't he modify them all? I think it's because of the creed that has been formed uh, this way. And so, as we said, he goes from eunuchus to unigenitus, and in eugenitus, you can see the root of our word genesis, beginning, right? And so, uh, genitus is the Greek quote of genao, which is that to give birth or to beget or to be born, depending on if it's active voice male, he begot or sired a child. Active voice female, she gave birth. Passive voice, he was born or she was born. Uh, she was birthed uh, this way. And so it's out of that that we get this attempt toward monogenao, only begotten, but it doesn't make any linguistic sense anywhere else uh, in history. So again, um, he starts publishing in 382, which is the calendar year after, not necessarily a full 12 months, but in, in the next calendar year. And again, as I said, this is the basis of the Textus Receptus of Erasmus. It has this influence, and so it comes out in our King James. But it all comes from a theological edit by Jerome that matches the new creed we don't have an etymological, you know, dictionary-based type connection. So I think it's ultimately a creedal influence. But let's go to the Bible now. We cited some of these, but I want to go now to the Septuagint. And so, again, for those who weren't here, theologians, the LXX is the Roman numeral 70, 70. And this is because of the legend that 70 rabbis translated the Hebrew Aramaic Old Testament into Greek. And so this is our shorthand instead of writing out Septuagint, LXX, boom, easy. <clears throat> and the Septuagint was finalized somewhere 150 to 200 years before Christ. Uh, 100 around 150 or so years before Christ, plus or minus a little you know, this way. Because so many Jews were losing their Hebrew, the rabbis wanted to have something to keep them in the text, you know, due to the dispersion, etc. Okay. Now, what's interesting, we have to be careful. Um, if A implies B, that does not guarantee that B implies A in reverse, right? So if Passover applies unleavened bread, that doesn't guarantee that if it's unleavened bread, it's Passover. Okay? In like manner, then, the Hebrew word yachid, which is to be alone or solitary, etc., 
while the Greek text throughout the Old Testament translates yachid with several different words, monogenes is one of those words, but the only time monogenes is used in the Septuagint is to translate yachid alone, only, etc., which is the one-to-one -one equivalent. Now again, there are other words for loneliness or yachid that they choose other terms besides monogenes, but there are a few here uh, uh, this way. And there are only four monogeneses in the Septuagint of the Old Testament text. And so um, we have Jephthah, where his daughter comes out and everything, right? We know the story, hopefully. And it says she was his only yachid, child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And so the Septuagint, she was his monogenes child, his unique, his only uh, child. And so again, the focus is on the solitary, unique nature of this child, not on the fact that he begot her. We already know that because she's his daughter. And so the Yahid is not telling us about her origins. It's telling us about her uniqueness as the only child and he had no other children. <clears throat> the second two are in Psalm. And this is tricky because the verse chapter divisions don't match our English. And so uh, in English, Psalm 2220, which is 2121 in the Septuagint, and 3517 English, 3417 Septuagint, where um, it's basically your personal life. Uh, the dogs are out to get my personal life, save me. And so in the text they said, the dogs are out to get my monogenes, <laughs> uh, my uniqueness, you know, kind of my unique self uh, this way. And so those have nothing to do with begetting at all. And then the text here again, the difference it says, I am desolate and afflicted. The desolate here again is Yahid, and we could also say lonely. I'm lonely, I'm abandoned this way. And so the only one of these three that could be tied to the concept of begetting would be Jephthah's daughter. And there we already know that she's the daughter. This is not a statement about how she came into existence, it's a statement about her uniqueness as being the only child. So the monogenes translations from the Old Testament don't work well to support the idea that monogenes is about begetting. They just don't work well. New Testament, we'll hear more detail now. Luke has three uses. And Luke the physician, every single one is of only children, or possibly an only son, but I suspect it was an only child. And so Jairus' daughter is very clearly the only child he has, like Jephthah, no other sons or daughters. She's his monogenes daughter. Um, the widow of Nain, where it's her monogenes son, there's the possibility that she might have daughters, but this was her only son. But I think it's more likely, based on the other text, that this was her only child, period, who happened to be a son. And then um, the demon-possessed guy at the bottom of the mountain after the transfiguration, where, again, this is my only child, and he throws himself into the fire. And so each one of Luke is only children, where we're not worried about issues of how they came into being is showing that they're the sole child. Hebrews 11, Isaac, this is the fourth and I think final, Isaac is said to be Abraham's monogenes child. And again, we touched this briefly in the sermon time, but that went so fast it doesn't hurt to refresh ourselves, right? And... Uh, <clears throat> The key here is that Abraham has seven other sons with at least two other women, right? Hagar has Ishmael and Keturah has six more sons on the assumption that Keturah and Hagar are not the same woman. Um, there is some Jewish tradition that tries to conflate those two, but I'm not convinced. Um, 
but they weren't Sarah. And so to me, arguing that this is the only uh, son of Sarah doesn't work because she's not mentioned. He's the monogenes of Abraham in the text, not the monogenes of Sarah. But because we know, if he, especially from the story of Ishmael, right? Before God announces <coughs> that um, you're going to have a baby about this time next year, he's introduced circumcision. And when God makes this first announcement, I'm changing Sarah to Sarai to Sarah, and Abraham's first response was not laughter because he doesn't think God is serious. His first response was, oh, let Ishmael live before your sight. And God says, no, he's not going to be the heir. And then somewhere in there, it's through Isaac, your descendants will be named. And so because Isaac is the one that's appointed by God as the official heir, and that the name of Abraham goes through Isaac and not so much through the others, that separates Isaac and makes him unique. He's the unique appointed son of Abraham. So it's clearly <clears throat> not telling us about origins. It's about the uniqueness that he's one of a kind. There's no other son, plus his supernatural birth to a postmenopausal woman getting pregnant. You know, that's unique as well. Uh, that's unique as well. And uh, that's a sermon I preached here eight or nine years ago. And so uh, 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 I'll just say this much. Uh, Sarah is at least 13 years into menopause when God comes and says about this time next year. But this is supposed to be a son of Abraham's loins, right? So Isaac cannot be conceived the way Jesus was. We need the biological tie, but there's no reason for a couple to try to make a baby if she's 13 years in menopause, except God made a promise. And so they got busy because God made a promise, not because they thought it was possible. This is the foundation of, this is the foundation of righteousness by faith. You don't have to feel like a new creature. You have to trust you are because God said so. Yeah. <clears throat> That's an old sermon, one of my favorites. Uh, so a little, that little bonus. So this is why Isaac is unique then, because he's the child of promise, and he's the child through whom the messianic line and everything is going to come, and that separates him from the other seven brothers who don't have that privilege, so to speak. Uh, if I can use that word in this society now, uh, and go from there. So as I say, the anti-Trinitarians are focusing more, less on only child, or actually they're on the only child instead of the only child. And by focusing more on the child, it takes them to the origins issue, you know, the begottenness and so forth, uh, this way, whereas the text, I think, is going the other way. And so, uh, thus they feel it's on the begetting. My response, we get the concept of begetting from the term child, not from monogenes. And so when she's the monogenes child, it's the child that tells us she was begotten by him, not the monogenes. Okay, monogenes tells us what kind of begotten she is but not that she was begotten uh, this way. And so we need to keep that in mind. And particularly in those, like my precious life text, those two in Psalms, David didn't beget himself, you know. Nor does the king beget himself into kingship uh, that way as well. <clears throat> now, in John, right, one more time, there we go. He uses monogenes five times, <clears throat> four times in the Gospel of John and once in the epistle, first epistle. Always of Jesus and always in reference to the incarnate Christ. Never, as far as I can tell, to the pre-incarnate Christ. 
And so um, John 1, chapters 14 and 18, where he's just setting up, you know, we beheld his glory, the glory of the monogenes of the Father, you know. <clears throat> Those kind of texts. But we're beholding his glory in the incarnated form. Uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Well, that giving shows it's the incarnation, right? And so John is always using it of the incarnated Christ. And I don't have 1 John 4, 9, but I think it's similar to John 1. Um, again, but he's clearly talking about Jesus in the context of being incarnated this way. So all of his do that. So what makes Christ one of a kind or unique? And part of the answer is he's the only being who's God and man at the same time. Okay, He's the only being who's God and man at the same time. So in the Bible, monogenes focuses on uniqueness, not origins. The onlyness of the child, the uniqueness of the child, and we have good reason to think then that these Christological texts, like the Latins had figured out, focuses on the concept of uniqueness, one of a kindness, uh, this way. But because of the wrongful linking of monogenes to begetting, uh, we're going to need to look at the verb genao to finish building this out. But while I'm here, I'm going to add one more thing. And I need... Ah, here he is. Here's a good example to me of the difference between being literalistic and contextually literal. What version of the Bible did Ellen White have? King James. Authorized King James. <clears throat> Was Ellen White trained in Greek? No. J. N. Andrews? Yes. Ellen White? No. J. N. Andrews, in fact, was reputed to have the whole New Testament memorized in Greek. He said he could reproduce the whole New Testament in Greek by memory. So that's a brain. At any rate, um, no, he just didn't have all the Facebook and stuff to fill up his brain with. <clears throat> so Ellen White will have extensive quotes where she'll talk about Jesus as the only begotten. She goes back, you know, into the prehistory of uh, the, the Jesus as the only begotten. And so people read this and say, see, Jesus is saying, I mean, Ellen White's saying Jesus was begotten. Uh, she's just quoting it in the King Jamesian sense. And in my estimation, if you actually read the sentences, she's clearly using it in the sense of being unique and one of a kind not in the sense of making a theological sense about begottenness. So she uses it in the Greek way, but she uses it with the English language that she inherits that was influenced by Jerome. So I think when you actually read the sentences, I looked up, I don't know, 50 or more of them, it's always in the sense of being the unique one of a kind, not making a statement of some kind of begetting in eternity. And so that's where, if you do your homework, honestly, I think it's hard to turn that. Whereas if you're, um, oh, I have this belief. Oh, see, she says it's begotten. And you don't have any, and you just, you know, proof text very over-literalized. That's some of the problem we have with her writings on this issue uh, this way. So, let's go to Ganao now. Let's stop. Anybody with a question about monogenes? Again, literally one of a kind. One of a kind. Literally. Uh, unique. So God sent his one of a kind. And this is where it will say some translations, one and only son uh, in the modern English, because they're trying to be more faithful to the Greek and take that interpretive element of Jerome back out. Okay. And so then these people are like, oh, only the King James Bible is, you know, inspired. And that's interesting because that didn't exist until 1609. So what do they do for a Bible before 1609, you know? Uh, did Paul have the King James? Yeah. 
No, he was writing the Greek that the King James came out of, you know. So, uh, People get worried about these when it gets too close to pet opinions. Genao, again, is the Greek version. Um, I didn't push the button here. There we go. So we're going to look at this. Some of the early church fathers leveraged Genao to a temporal or eternal beginning of the sun. Remember our whole Usia business uh, this way. And some do it for subordination. Uh, we had two groups of Trinitarians or semi-Trinitarians. Um, you had the ones fighting Arius who wanted Jesus to be begotten so he could be of the same Usia but viewed him in that eternal relationship as ultimately fully God and equal. But others introduced the idea that the father-son language meant that as soon as the son is in this eternal beginning process, he is, as son, eternally subordinate. As opposed to not being subordinate and then through the incarnation having a temporary subordination period as the God-man, and then after the resurrection, being raised back to his full function and no longer subordinate again. So you have the eternal subordination versus the temporary subordination. And as I say, in theological debates over the ordination of women, the anti-women have tended to go to eternal subordination to try to build an argument, and the egalitarians tend to go to the equality, the temporary argument, and so forth. And so you can see where they pull Trinity into discussions I'm not sure Trinity was meant to address. Uh, and off we go. Now again, the difference would be that in Christianity, they went to this eternal beginning, whereas our anti-Trinitarians are going to a singular act of beginning where the Father does actually precede the Son in existence. There's a time where he's all alone. Then he begets the Son, and they make these weird analogies like Eve was in Adam, and the way Eve was brought out of Adam, Christ was brought out of the Father. I'm not apparently reading the same Genesis text they are, because my Genesis text says that God took something from the side of Adam, and then... After it was out of Adam, it says he built a woman. He uses the architectural term for building a house. Okay, bana. And so he literally built a woman. And it's Adam in the poetic celebration who says she was taken out of man uh, this way. So you have this slightly different view of begetting. And so from a technical standpoint... Our anti-Trinitarians believe more in a permanent begetting. It technically can't be eternal because it had a beginning. Whereas the other folk, it would be an eternal, I mean, an eternal, uh, a temper, uh, I'm getting tang tongue tangled. Our anti-Trinitarians, let's reload, would believe in a permanent subordination. <clears throat> it can't be eternal because, you know, there's, in the going backwards way, it would be eternal going that way, but not that way. Whereas the uh, mainliners who went with this believed in an everlasting both directions subordination. And the eternal subordination was rejected by the, the councils of the church somewhere in that late Trinity process or so. Uh, I haven't pinned that one down to which council, but I know it's in that ballpark this way. So the eternal subordination was rejected by the church long before women's discussions became an issue, and uh, by the Christian church. But it's reviving for different purposes uh, today. Uh, by the way, what I've also noted in some of the churches I've gone to is that our anti-Trinitarians with their... Um, Jesus was begotten and now subordinate and, and then the angels. And they build this philosophical structure, kind of an order of governance with who's in charge of what and the whole organizational chart that comes down into husband and wife and children 
And so you have this whole philosophical ordering of reality that if we just keep these rules, everything will go well, you know, uh, kind of a thing. And we're just modeling after this. And so ultimately, I think they're looking for something to bring some kind of structure, authority, um, order out of the chaos of life. And if we follow this order that they think is divinely given, that's the magic bullet that will fix all of our problems, you know. Now, as I said in our interview, uh, in whether Old or New Testament, the verbs for begetting, again, if it's a guy, it means he sired a child. If it's a gal, it means she gave birth to the child that he sired. And if it's the child, that means he was given birth to, he was born, or she. Did it go two? I'm trying to go back one. We'll see if it... Wanting to... Uh... Okay, it seems to be holding. In the New Testament, ganao is used of Christ, but only in two different ways. <clears throat> Being born, so Luke one thirty five, he was born of Mary, <clears throat> passive voice, through the Holy Spirit, um, etc. Here the Holy Spirit is the one who causes the pregnancy again. And then John 18, Jesus said he was born to give witness to the truth. John 8.41, he's accused of being born of fornication. And then Paul's famous text that God sent into the Son into the world, born of a woman, to become the curse for us. So in each of these passive voices, it's always of the earthly birth of Jesus being born into this world. I don't think anybody would dis even my anti-Trinitarians would have to agree with that one. You know, it's just, duh. The second use, however, is three times we have a direct quotation of Psalm 2, verse 7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. One of which we've already seen in Hebrews and we'll come back to in a moment. So I have a little article in Perspective Digest, like a little two and a half page thing from my presidential column on this. We're going to, we look at each use of Psalm 2, verse 7, direct quotations. For example, some would say the voice from heaven at the baptism, you are my, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. They see that as an allusion to Psalm 2 but it's not clearly a quote. I'm going for just the quotes, the direct quotations. And so, let's get the text fully. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. There's your installation. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, now the king who's installed is responding, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So this is what God is saying to the king that he's just installed. And so the anti-Trinitarians assert that this is a clear biblical reference to this begetting of the Son back in eternity and this coronation element in verse 6, which is very clear among others. Um, if you read the whole psalm, it's obvious because you have why are the nations raging against the king? They want to depose the king that God is set up, but God laughs at heaven, you know, front at them and holds them in derision. And then you get to this, okay, uh, et cetera. So is this a literal beginning? What, how do the New Testament authors interpret this text? I think it's best to let inspired interpret inspired whenever uh, possible. So I think I've kind of jumped again. The king is installed into office, and we have this language of siring or birthing as the metaphor that we've talked about already into this new way of life. And because it's a coronation, it's clearly not a literal, physical beginning where we got to wait 18 or 20 years for him to become king.
First text in the New Testament, Acts 13. And this is one of Paul's speeches. I forget to whom now. Um, I don't think we've quite made it as far as Lystra yet, but we're earlier in the chapters where they were set forth on their first missionary journey. The Holy Spirit set them aside. And he's telling somebody, I forget, we bring you good news that what God promised to the fathers, oh, he's got a Jewish audience here, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by what? Raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. So this is very interesting. Paul says that the raising of Jesus up to heaven, you know, the resurrection and ascension, is the fulfillment of Psalm 2, verse 7. Right? This he has fulfilled as it is written in the second psalm. So Paul, speaking here, very much is applying Psalm 2-7 to the post-resurrection risen Christ. He's not going backwards into eternity. He's going to the installation of Jesus after the resurrection, that he's being coronated uh, this way. And so uh, Psalm 2-7, quoted in Acts 13, is applied to the post-resurrection Jesus. Here's the one that we had earlier, and I'll work him backwards again, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That is Psalm 2, 7, and I think uh, I will be to him a father, he shall be to my son, I think is verse 8. I know it's also in Psalm 2. So, the very fact we're quoting a coronation psalm, but then after making purifications and before that, he's being appointed. And then we discover as we read the book of Hebrews that he's been appointed as the Melchizedek and king priest to intercede for us. And so notice again the timing after making purification for sins, he sat down. And so the author of Hebrews, I think it's Paul, but it's disputed in scholarship. The author of Hebrews seems to be putting here Psalm 2-7 to the same time frame as Acts. Post-resurrection, fulfillment as a typological prophecy. This way, not going back before the creation of the world, etc., etc., but going to the resurrected Jesus' arrival in heaven after the resurrection. So, so far, two guys agreeing, or two texts, I think it's one Paul saying the same thing in two different ways. The final one, Hebrews 5, verse 5, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, there's your installation kind of stuff, but was appointed, there's that word again, by him who said to him, you my son are my son, today I have begotten you. So again, this is very blunt that he is saying this Psalm 2 to appoint him into this high priestly office, which is after the resurrection. So we've got the appointment after the resurrection. It's not dealing with eternity, etc., etc. Now, not using... Uh, not using Psalms, it is interesting that in Romans 1, Paul says that through the resurrection, Christ was designated or appointed as son. I see Elder Brand shaking his head. Let's go look. I mean, he's like, whoa, you know. But let's pull it up and just read it for ourselves and make sure I got the nuance fully correct. Romans 1, verse 4. And we have to back up a little. Um, Paul, obviously speaking to the Jewish ear first in this apostle. Uh, 
he, in verse 2, the gospel he, that God promised through the scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his what? Resurrection from the dead. He was declared by the resurrection to be the son. And so while he doesn't have... Um, the actual coronation language, you have this parallel idea that there was some designation of sonship after the resurrection based on the resurrection. Today I declare you as my well. He declares himself as the father. So let me see, see those. Let me, let me make sure I'm just using the the, the word. Those would be even. the non-trinitarian, anti-trinitarian are definitely going to want. In fact, they're going to say these are bad translation. Mm -hmm. So they're going to favor the more formal King James Revised Standard kind of stuff. And I wouldn't be surprised if a fair number of them lean toward King James as the only and best. Um, yeah, because both of these translations says today I am your father. It does not use the word begotten. Yeah, well. So in, is that the one? In, in Greek, it is mm -hmm. ganao because it's quoting the psalm. And so in the Greek, it's very literally, you're my son today, I have begotten you. So, is it, so the, does it just kind of get mired down in semantics? Because people like the message or they like the ESV or the RSV. It can get a little mired down in semantics once you lock your theology onto the exact translation. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was first introduced to textual criticism as a freshman religion major, it rattled my cage. What do you mean we have multiple texts, you know, and we have to sift? Them? Ah, how can I trust this is the word of God, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the short answer is we have so many manuscripts that we have very clear consensus and so forth and so on. Um, where was I going with this? In, ah, some of our Adventists who play King James only games, they're not doing it for Trinity reasons. They're doing it for law of God reasons. And I forget the exact text. It's um, down in Revelation 20, as I recall. And, of course, I grew up memorizing in the King James, Blessed are they who do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. It's 20 or 21 area, yeah. Right? So, blessed are they. I think most of us are familiar with that text, right? If you go to a modern translation, what does it say? Blessed are they who wash their robes. If you have a good commentary, they will give you the English phonics. In Greek, phonetically, the they who wash their robes and the they who keep his commandments, extremely similar sounding. Extremely similar sounding. Kind of like the old, you know, tongue twister, she sells seashells by the seashore. You try to say that one fast and it gets tangled up. The majority that we have, the best evidence is wash their robes. However, they recognize that keep the commandments is a significant minority. It's not just a few, but it's still a clear minority of the choices we have. And so by looking at what are the oldest manuscripts and some of these, you know, common sense rules, they've come to the conclusion that the, it's more likely, blessed are they who wash their robes. So our poor Adventists say, see, they are antinomian, they, you know, because they lost a favorite proof text, right? But I think I can show from the book of Revelation that those who wash their robes keep the commandments. I don't need that one verse. Okay? And so what happens is people get favorite translations because it happens to have the pet phrase for their pet theology as opposed to being able to build a broad biblical case. 
And that's also my complaint with the non-Trinitarians, especially with their use of Ellen White. They go find these obscure, somewhat ambiguous statements while they ignore the mm, many. For example, how many times does she say third person of the Godhead, divine trio, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then they go to the text where the only one besides the Father who could do this is the Son. See, there's only two. Well, the nature of the Holy Spirit to be in the background out of sight, it would make sense you'd only see two, you know. I mean, yeah, let's be careful not to read too much, right? But um, so you've got to take the whole picture. And so usually the folk who are real hell-bent on King James only have a pet theological peeve that doesn't work well in other translations. And my contention is if your theological peeve were correct, we ought to be able to demonstrate it with more than one key proof text. Yeah, one key. <clears throat> and probably be able to build it out of one translation, though I'm going to put a little asterisk on that. First of all, we need to separate paraphrase from translation. So like, I think you have some of the living Bibles and stuff or Jack Blanco's clear word. You know, these are paraphrases. And so that's a personal interpretation, um, which is helpful for devotional life, but not necessarily good for precise biblical study. Okay. And Blanca would not want you using it. He wants you to use it devotionally, not, you know. And this is why he calls it the clear word and not the clear word Bible. Okay. But we have two kinds of translations. We have what we call formal translations and dynamic translations. And formal translations are closer to a one-to-one -one word unless it's a very clear idiom, then they translate the idiom. A figure of speech. So, for example, did you know that the God of the Old Testament has a long nose? We translate it long of nose as slow to anger. Because we don't get the idiom, but a, a short nosed person was a short tempered person. And the long-nosed person is the... So God's long-suffering, he got as long of nose. <clears throat> Very literally in Hebrew. Obviously, that doesn't work in English, so we have to take that idiom of long of nose, say, yeah, he's slow to anger, he's patient, you know. And so the formal translations will translate thus those idiomatic phrases into something that makes sense. Okay. The dynamics try to take more like the whole phrase or thought and so the dynamic translation will have a little bit more of an interpretive element to it than the formal translation. So um, uh, English standard is going to be closer to formal. That's what I've been reading from. Revised standard, some of these. Uh, New International is more dynamic. A today's English Bible, more dynamic, uh, you know, etc. Uh, often the Bibles for easy English are more dynamic uh, this way. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Where the dynamics do run into trouble is when you have the tight symbolism of prophecy in Daniel and Revelation. And the dynamics mess up your ability. Uh, the formals are a little bit clear on what's what and who belongs to who and, and so forth. And even there, though, the formals can have a translational bias where probably since 1980 or so, the formal translations tend to translate, punctuate Daniel 9 in a way that favors dispensationalism with the Israel theology and so on. Whereas the King James, who didn't have that bias, is actually, I think, a little more honest to the general it's not an easy passage anyway. So this little disc excursion from Lydia's question, um, people will gravitate. If they have pet theology that they don't want to surrender, they will gravitate toward a biblical translation that's easiest 
to promote and defend that theology from. And so the more dependent you are on a given translation, the higher the probability in my mind that you have a set opinion that you really don't want Scripture to judge. <clears throat> now notice I said the higher the probability. I think there are some who may be honestly seeking God's will, but the cultural conditioning and whatever else, they're kind of stuck in this rut. But often our people with new lights, so to speak, are on, on a, um, a kick here, you know, to use a particular translation because it supports them. So, yes. Let's get the microphone for the recording here. So when there is a discussion as concerning the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 and we come upon translational differences, what do we do? We go back to the King James Version and use that as our point of reference? I don't know about the Holy Spirit having major contradictions between versions, but um, if I don't have, obviously the best thing is if we can go back to uh, the best Greek and Hebrew access, but if you're not trained in that, it gets a little ugly. Um, that's where reaching out for help to some of us who have training or um, um, some of our Adventist commentaries may offer some technical assistance. Otherwise, again, uh, I can take a bunch of translations and try to compare. And then the other thing to always keep in mind is the larger theological picture of Scripture. So let me give you an example how the New World Translation um, of the Jehovah's Witnesses and now the later, what I don't know if they call it the Revised New World or whatever they call their new one, um, the usual proof texts of Jesus have been monkeyed with so it's not as clear. But if you read enough passages about Jesus, you know, like that later section, you God and so forth and calling him Yahweh, I think I can still get that out of their Bible because I can take them back to the Psalms. That this is the Psalm here that's being quoted and go back. And while it's more difficult, if I look at the larger biblical flow of theology, I can start to smell some of these fishes uh, just for the good contextual wide biblical knowledge. And then comparing a number of translations where 15 of them are here and the new world is here, probably a good shot at the 15. <laughs> All right, and so that, that is a, a comparison thing. And then being willing to say the preponderance of evidence. I may have one text that's a little... Eh. Um, we actually have a good answer to this one now, but I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, but the old preaching to the spirits of prison used to be one of the toughest ones dealing with immortal soul. But if that's the only challenging text and I have a good explanation for all the rest, then I have to say, obviously we're not understanding something here. And I can leave this one text in a bit of limbo because my faith isn't based on one text, it's on this evidence of text. And usually we can get enough evidence of text that if there's one or two that are a little, eh, we can recognize that and it won't destroy our faith because we have enough of the pieces put together to do it. So broad biblical knowledge, context, comparing translations, put all that kind of tool together to get as broad a base of data as possible and then work with the Holy Spirit. And if all else fails, this is why we have pastors and professors and so forth. And you may have a question we've never thought of and say, huh? I got to go to a little digging down myself, you know. And that's the fun of being a pastor or professor is that you guys ask us questions that we never thought of and it sends us scurrying to the books and makes it fresh for us uh, that way. So this comparison, both, um, you know, like word studies, if you can follow it in the Greek or Hebrew, and uh, thematic studies, um, if this is all saying stuff about Jesus is, you know, da, 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 and suddenly this one verse, Jesus seems to be in contradiction. Everything else is clear. All right, there's a problem with this verse and my understanding of it, but 
but I'm not going to let this big picture um, be lost because of one verse. Once before I had a Bible study and we got hung up on this thing of the Trinity. Yep. And I, I did the best I could to give them all the scripture I could. And that was the only point that kept them from baptism. Yep. And sometimes it's difficult. Um, sometimes it's difficult uh, when they're hung up. I think we also need to make a difference. There's a fellowship of worship where there's no doctrinal commitment. It's just a social commitment not to cause trouble. And we worship together. Then we have the membership level where we agree that this is God's general will for our lives and we're willing to hold each other accountable. And so a person like that, we always want to make sure we're welcoming into the social fellowship uh, of the church and give them room. You know, give them room. It sometimes takes time for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and allowing them room to grow in Christ without... We've borne witness, and we'll give you some space. Come worship with us. We'll figure this out later. Um, uh, we love you. Can do more than just trying to nail it down to the last umlaut without, uh, without the love, you know. I'm wondering how much time, how much do you have left so we don't, you know, stay? Yeah, eternal. we've had a few good interruptions, and that's good. Um, um, so I think I've pretty well done... Psalms, and I just want to do a few more. I don't have this memorized, but I don't think I'm that far from the kingdom. Uh, so let me, let me go a little further. On this same thing then, when the angel talks to Mary, and I need to catch this up now. On the sonship of Christ, it's very easy, interesting. When she says, how can, I, how can this happen? How can I get pregnant? I've not known a man. The angel answers, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, and this is a very strong therefore in Greek, I am drawing on this basis or for this reason. Um, deal. The child shall be called holy, the Son of God. And so according to the angel, Jesus is called Son because of the incarnation. Because he is sired without a human father. So, so he is very literally son of God as a human this way. And so the angel says that's why he's going to be called son, not something back here, but because of the in incarnation now. And I think that's a key point. Uh, a couple of comments on Proverbs 8. This is the same issue, and with limited time, we can't go as deep. But Proverbs 8 is the chapter where wisdom as a woman is speaking how she was possessed by God at the beginning and how through wisdom God created the world by me and so forth and so on. And many, 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 many Christians from Ellen White to Augustine see this wisdom as Jesus. Okay. Because of the creation, right? And in there it talks about, and I don't know if I have the verses. Yeah. I just I have the references. It talks about um, by the way, some modern translations do blow this one. They'll say that wisdom was created in the beginning. No, the word is kana, to possess. It's never used of create. But they can't figure out what it means to possess, so they get interpretive uh, this way. And so that's what this slide out is. But down here, you, again, you have this idea of being birthed or begotten. And, being, and hence, that's often translated in English as being brought forth. So wisdom was brought forth. But you have this and some language here, uh, the verb for, for uh, set up. Wisdom is set up and brought forth. And the setting up is the same word as in verse Psalm 2, where God is setting up the king in the coronation. So we have these linguistic ties between Proverbs 8 and Psalm 2 that show that both are showing an installation into office. Now, Proverbs is suggesting 
that Christ took on this role of the wisdom and creating and being installed as the mediatorial figure between God and the world, that he takes on that role before the creation and creates from within that role. And so in that sense then, I would say Proverbs allows us to suggest that Christ took the honorific title of son then, even though it was in anticipation of his actually becoming human son later. But Proverbs 8, everybody agrees, is another installation ceremony like a coronation. You've even got the same verbs, same metaphors, etc. And so this is not a literal begetting back in eternity. Samuel. So, yeah, I have a question about, like, the Proverbs 8 thing. I don't, is it right for us to try to make that about Jesus when, pro, in Proverbs, uh, wisdom is personified as a woman in other chapters? But why is Proverbs 8 the only chapter where we say it's Jesus, but in other chapters, when wisdom is being personified, we don't account that to Jesus? I don't see how that's wise for us to do. It's a good question. I haven't made this my life study, so I wish Dr. Davidson were here, but um, I, my guess would be, my, my personal feeling is, it's because of the statements of wisdom that God created through me. I was there. And so you have all these statements that parallel who Jesus is in chapter 8, whereas when wisdom is on the corner, come learn from me and so forth, you don't have the clear Christological ties that you do in Proverbs 8. And that's why I think most people tie it to 8 because of the creation, uh, creator theology that's in there. That would be my best guess. Uh, that way. That's a good question. Uh, let me see. I think I got just a couple more slides and then we can open up uh, uh, the floor here. So again, I think Proverbs is suggesting that the economics of who was going to do what for humans and their salvation, we know from Paul that was already planned before he made the world. Proverbs appears to be giving us a window into that pre-creation adopting of the role and installation uh, into that role. Uh, just like Psalms uh, is later uh, applied to the Christ installation afterwards. So, who cares? That's right. Not used to having double play here. So, why does it matter? We've done a bit of this already. Again, I believe the theological purpose of the Trinity is to remind us that you can't figure out God and then he's too big for you to figure out. God is mystery. He reveals himself in certain ways. That revelation is um, um, sure and reliable, but it will never be complete to our mind because we couldn't handle it. And hence, again, it's like the second commandment it's supposed to help us not put God in our little box and think we've got him figured out so we can make him manageable, et cetera, et cetera. Second thing, I would again argue we know God through his roles and something went too far. Um, we don't really know him in his being. We know him like the child knows mommy and daddy through the role of parent. And then they develop a theory of marriage, watching mommy and daddy in the kitchen and in the car and at church. But when things go to bed and mom and dad shut the door, the child doesn't have a clue. Doesn't have a clue. And so we know God the same way by how he interacts with us and what the Trinity are in the fullness of their privacy I don't think we should speculate there. Again, we had this quote earlier, had God the Father come down, he wouldn't know the difference. And we go back to what I said earlier. Uh, I think I went too far. Again, I think it diminishes the power of the gospel. If Christ is God Jr., it does not mean as much about his self-sacrifice for us as if he's God God. And the self-sacrificial character of our God represented through Christ is undermined and diminished if Christ is not fully eternal in God and so forth and so on. 
uh, this way. He becomes the hireling. And then we have to say, what does Emmanuel mean? God with us or is it semi-God with us? Uh, yeah, et cetera. And the I am. Finally, as I said earlier today, I think the impersonal Holy Spirit, again, first of all, big Bible authority issues because you've got to ignore a bunch of text. Secondly, clearly contradicts Ellen White, which is an Adventist problem. Impersonal, I think, tends toward a pantheistic presence of God and then the impersonal um, interaction. If God just sends impersonal to save us, do we just send impersonal to save others uh, this way? I think the Holy Spirit being fully... In fact, Paul says, and Ellen White quips on this, that no one knows the inner heart of the man except, quote, the spirit of the man. And no one knows the inner part of God except the spirit of God. And Ellen White links that, that the Holy Spirit speaks with our spirit to bring us the inner things of God. But if he's not personal, it seems like it's hard for him to bring us a communication of that nature uh, this way. I think it affects missiology. And then, of course, as you've experienced, all this wrangling over the mysteries of God sidetracks the church from why we're here. We're busy arguing with each other instead of uh, being out doing the work of the Lord. So I think there's multiple layers to the significance of this Trinity business. And um, let's, let me rephrase. I think that we have solid biblical ground for the, for the divinity and personhood of Jesus, the full eternity and so forth, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, and his ministry to us, I think we've got good biblical reasons to say this in that we're not, you know, having to spiritualize the text or make some strange, you know, mystical interpretation. You know, it's common sense reading of the text with common sense questions. I think our faith is well founded and we can be confident uh, in it. So, I'm happy to do some Q&A if people, I know if... Uh, Q&A, general open end, um, if uh, people need to go, but I can hang around if people want to grab a mic and uh, keep asking questions this way. I have a question. I have, I have a few. Um, when it comes to the word Elohim, which is talking about a plural God, doesn't that point to the fact that, you know, there is a Godhead? Question about Elohim. <clears throat> Hebrew has six or eight different uses of the plural. Okay. One of which is more than, actually more than two. <laughs> they have a dual for two and then three and up. Basically, three to ten is plural, and after that it goes collective. So it doesn't, Elohim. Elohim is usually classified as what we call a plural of majesty. So it's not, not the best argument that Elohim shows there's more than one in the Godhead as such. It's just showing that God is more complex than us. Okay. However, there are indicators in the Old Testament even, of this plurality. So we take the creation of man, and we all know this text. Genesis 1, around 26. Let us, whoa, make man in our image after our likeness according to our kind. What's this us language? Now, some people try to say God is talking with angels, but angels don't communicate and don't create. And I think we have an indicator here of a divine plurality, even though it's one God, because there's an us. And there's this internal us combination. A little later on, look, man is like one of us, etc. Okay? And yet, at the same time, and so thus, male and female, he created them as the image of God. See, in that verse, you have the plurals. But then it will say, so God made man in his image, like the next verse. And it goes singular. 
And so you have the us and the his. The his showing the oneness, and yet at the same time, this us suggests there's more. And it makes sense then that if God has some kind of plurality and oneness, that Adam and Eve, let us make man in our image, so God made man in his image, male and female, plurality, he made them, that something about this male and femaleness that we later learn can be joined as one flesh, in oneness, we get this plurality and oneness in the image of God, suggesting the plurality and oneness in the God himself. Other texts, um, like the quote in uh, Hebrews from the Psalm, was it 95 or something, God, your God, the thing you get, or the Lord said to my Lord. And so we get these multiple lords and interdivine communications. Now to get three out of it's tough, but at least we know there's some kind of us that's deity having these conversations. And in the New Testament, it becomes clear who they are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think we can sort of tease it out of the old, but it's, once you have the new, it's easier. So I would say in the New Testament, we do have evidences of a plurality of personages, though the precision to nail it down to three is more difficult. But I would do it through that us type language and not through the term Elohim itself. Good question. Yes. Straight behind her. Okay. Oh, you had another question? Yes, but please go ahead. Oh. I'll, I'll wait. Okay, I'll, uh, you just point me where I'm going and holler. So who's next? Right. Hello. Oh. Uh, all right. A lot of things run through my head, so I'll try to get, make this as clear as possible. Um, okay, like going back to when you were saying that uh, made in our image, or, you know, we were made in our, and then the word, the word of God, uh, If you want to think for a moment yeah. to clarify, maybe we can run with the other and come oh, back to you. With the water and, oh, okay. And the word. Okay. So the word was uh, created. Um, oh, with the sun. Okay. So the word, so the sun is the word of God, right? And then in uh, being eternal, where the words come from, since we were, I'm sorry, I got to think about it. <laughs> I'm getting all tangled up. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's come back this way. We'll kind of go left, right, left, right. So my question is, within Adventism, when we are, when these anti-Trinitarians or non-Trinitarians um, surface, what has been your experience that do they leave and start, I mean, are they trying to create their own religious organization or they just remain Adventists but hold on to these beliefs? My experience is that um, a lot of these folks are a little older, probably 50 or and up, not all but some. Their burden is to reform the Adventist church because they know they would never be able to get a following outside the Adventist church. And they may not know it intellectually, but they know it in their heart. And therefore, their significance comes in trying to fix the church, not in leaving. And I personally think that there's a psychology of significance. Uh, a lot of these people I've encountered have a, defined their spirituality by what they oppose more than what they stand for. But since opposing outside the church has become unfashionable, they're now opposing the church itself. Uh, and if they left, they would have nothing to oppose. And so their sense of personal significance and purpose are driven by this opposition. And it almost becomes a type of pride where they, to let go and accept the truth would be to lose their mission and lose their significance. And so 
you have this personal significance issue that I think drives a lot of these people, uh, and it's a way of occupying important people's time and so forth uh, that way. So they're not, most of them will never leave because they would, they would uh, go, first of all, they're not going to go to a place that's not Sabbatarian, and secondly, they would lose what little influence they had. Okay, we're back over here. Oh, all right. My principal friend, was it Brother Cummings, right? Carrington. <coughs> Carrington. I knew it started with C. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> My question is related to Raymond's question, but I'm going a little bit further and a little bit more personal. Have you come across anti-Trinitarians um, at Southern? In the student body, yes. Not in the faculty? Not in the faculty. Okay. However, um, I need to be very delicate here. My understanding is, is that another university in the area let go a professor over Trinity issues. Uh, he's apparently possibly made a repentance because he's now teaching at an Adventist school in Florida. But um, for a while, uh, there was an Oakwood professor who seemed to have some troubles. And I, I, he left Oakwood or was let go. And he's now at the Florida Hospital College. But I think he's maybe had some change of heart. But I, as professionals, this is not an area that I have seen professional theologians gravitate to at all. They got other problems, but not that one. <laughs> okay, what are we over here? Okay. <clears throat> I kind of wrote a couple of notes. My thoughts were kind of cluttered like yours, Jesse, so I tried to write it out here. But I know my, my finite mind can't comprehend the infinite. I mean, it's hard to just, you know, to explain it, whatever. But my question is this. I try to make everything break it down simple so I can understand it, you know, since I can't really explain a trinity, you know, God, the Godhead. But I was trying to make comparisons in my own mind, like the oneness. You mentioned like man and wife, uh, man and woman becoming one. We can understand that. I can understand that. Becoming one flesh with my wife. And then... They become also, one and yet they don't. They stay individual. It's an interesting right, mystery. Right, exactly. Right? But the, the oneness still exists. And then when it talks about uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they equal one is what we're talking about right now. But then when I read stuff like um, in uh, Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 5.23, when it says the spirit, the soul, and the body, it's referring to one man. And I, I know it, the commentary says that that's not the constituent parts of a man. But if we're made in God's image, could that not still be how, you know, in the same sense? We're, and even Ellen White says that the, the physical sympathizes with the spirit in man, you know, is that still like the same without getting too, I don't want to go into the esoteric or what have you, you know, trying to explain that, but you follow what I'm saying? If uh, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual aspects of man, could that not be like a, a trinity? Is still one individual, one person. Uh, could that not be like an example of how uh, we are in God's image as well? Or is that a stretch? For me, it would be a little bit of a stretch because a couple things. Uh, I think that's one of maybe one or two verses at most that give the soul, body, spirit. That's not a common... Um, Paul does talk much more about you and your spirit. He says less about soul, quote-unquote. And so the rarity of that, I would be worried about making a full theology out that way. Uh, I think the, um, uh, you know, there is a temptation because of the apparent threeness. Um, soul seems to be the equivalent of, of the general sense of self um, in the New Testament. Uh, self or your personal sense of life. And, uh, you know, that I'm Steve Bauer and I, I have this identity and that's suke, you know, and so forth. We get our word psyche from that. Uh, spirit, especially out of the Old Testament, is a little bit more related to the motivational, private, inner sense where you can make a conversation with yourself, with your spirit as a functional, and it's your spiritual dimension this way. Where I think I would go with the image of God uh, is that 
uh, in the context of Genesis, we are moral beings. None of the rest of you know, animal creation have morality. They have instinct, but they don't have that sense of duty and right and wrong. But Adam and Eve become image of God, and boom, they have duty. Uh, they have a moral test. And so uh, the early fathers went with reason, but even animals can show some rational. You know, crows are very good at solving puzzles. Uh, but crows don't have a moral sense. So I would center image of God in our morality, and that he's a moral being and we're a moral being, and we're uniquely moral in the world outside of angels, obviously, as well. Uh, the temptation to take the three and the three, it's an interesting idea. Where it falls down for me is that each of these would be aspects of a person as opposed to independent, full functioning entities as a person. A body is not the person, and soul is not the full person, and spirit is not the full person, whereas in the Trinity, each one is fully, you know, God. And so that would be a little breakdown there. Okay? Is that a question or a direction? <clears throat> no, comment. <laughs> so when I started looking at this uh, just two or three months ago, when things began to blossom here, and started doing some research on from audio verse and articles you had put out and our own church manual. One thing came to mind, and that is if Jesus was created a subordinate to God, even if that was eternally begotten, and Lucifer was also created and subordinate to God, that when Lucifer raised the point that he should be promoted to be equal to God, or to be equal to Jesus, maybe he had a legitimate point. If we accept that Jesus was a created being, and if he had a legitimate point, then he should not have been kicked out of heaven, and if he should not have been kicked out of heaven, he never would have come to earth, and we never would have had the sin problem. <laughs> That is, a, uh, I think, a very lucid point. Um, now, of course, the hardcore anti-Trinitarian would say that Christ is not created, he's begotten, and would want to separate that some. I think. But still, if he has a point of beginning where he does not really exist beforehand, then I think it does blur that creature-creator boundary and gives Lucifer's side of the argument more, uh, more leverage. I personally think um, that a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets where around page 36 where uh, Lucifer is agitating heaven and she describes, and this is more a description than a quote, she describes how God gathered the heavenly host into an assembly and that he explained to them who Christ was. And he explained his role in their creation. And I had to stop and ask myself, why was an explanation necessary? And when I ask students this, I get the theology, right? Well, God is love. He wants, yeah, that's all true. But there was no explanation needed for who God the Father was. One look at the throne, no question. The fact that he's got to explain who Christ is suggests, read Proverbs 8, that he's taken the subordinate role and the undercover role and that he is interacting with angels in a kind of quasi-incarnate, perhaps looking more like an angel, and thus Lucifer can't except who he is. And so it's the same problem that humans had, uh, especially the Jews, but not only them, that when Jesus incarnated as God in human flesh, they could see the man but not accept the God. I think Lucifer had the same problem in heaven, that Jesus took on a servant form 
that did not visually show his power and glory. And therefore, Lucifer said, well, if him, why not me? And off we go. Uh, and that's where Ellen White says he explained the role as creator, which if he was created, he would not be able to explain such a role in her theology. So I think you're on the, absolutely the right track that if Jesus is God Jr., it gives more room to argue about who gets to be God Jr. and why and so forth. And I think that's a very interesting thought. <clears throat> Um, so, question. The word Trinity does not appear in the Bible, right? Yep. It's a, it's a descriptive word that the theologians created to try to describe something they saw. Okay. So, the question that I have is, when we talk about the Trinity, there are several denominations and groups that believe in the Trinity, and I and I believe that you know Godhead is a term that's used in Scripture. Do some of the anti-Trinitarians is that part of their argument for not believing in the Trinity? And that by saying Trinity, that aligns with some of the other denominations. For instance, the Catholic Church, their concept and their belief in Trinity is a little bit different. So, can you speak Ours to that? Ours is much less developed because we don't have all the philosophy. The term Godhead is a King James term in English. Uh, there is no Greek word Godhead. Um, that's a, a translational issue. Um, uh, it's in the Colossians text where in him all the fullness of deity would be very, very literal Greek uh, dwells. But the King James with its you know, Christian Trinitarian roots uses the term Godhead uh, in, in him, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt. But in Greek, it's just the fullness of divinity. And so the very language of Godhead is a later construct trying to help express Trinity and our Trinitarian pluralities and all that stuff. And so today, every Trinitarian is going to say they believe in the Godhead. <clears throat> The Godhead is these three. It's a triune Godhead. And uh, our anti-Trinitarians will try to nuance that Godhead is biblical and Trinity isn't. The reality is it's all mixed up now that uh, no one... Uh, there's no consistent usage that allows you between all the dominations and theologians that will allow you to make such a distinction and be understood as such. It's just, it's just not going to work. And so... Uh, I don't make a big term out of Godhead because, again, that's a later English term to take this basic word for deity or divinity uh, in the Bible. Now, as far as Trinity not being in the Bible, the word millennium is not in the Bible either. Uh, that's a Latin term. We do have the Greek thousand years, so millennium would be a Latin translation. But... Um, we can describe something we see in the scripture with a constructed term to, cap to capsulate the concept. For example, um, now this is closer to a Greek term, but the self-emptying of Jesus in Philippians 2 where he empties himself. Uh, the Greek verb is kanao, to device to yourself of privilege and so forth. So theologians have coined the term the kenosis to describe that passage, or the canonic passage, etc. So these are modern terms coined off of the original Greek, but not themselves found in the Bible. And so uh, just because a term is not found in the Bible, the question is, is the concept communicated by the term found in the Bible? <coughs> and I think the concept of basic triune God is there. Triune is just three and one. Triune. Three, one. That's all that. That is three and one. It's three, one put together. So we see three, yet they're one, yet we see three. We can't explain it. Oh, they're three and one. Triune. Triune of Trinity. And out of that comes that. So that's kind of a simplistic, but it's in the ballpark uh, explanation. So just because a label is not biblical doesn't mean we can't use it. Uh, 
For example, investigative judgment. <laughs> Biblical concept, but the phrase investigative judgment's not in the Bible. We use investigative to describe the process we see of God using books and holding court and, and so forth, that he conducts an investigation. And so to frame that, we say investigative judgment, but that label, not in the Bible. Which way are we going here? Okay. Yes, I'm trying to see. Um, Jesus, Jesus himself said he would, <clears throat> if someone says something against the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't be forgiven, but they said something against him, he would forgive them. So in that particular passage, it appears as if he's putting the Holy Spirit next to God in that particular passage before himself. And what does that mean? It shows us the nature of God as a humble being. First of all, Christ was speaking in that context, living within our limits as a human. So this is the same Jesus who says the Father is greater than I. Because at that point, he's living in the subordinated, I relinquished my equality, and because I let go of my equality, he is now the greater, the more authoritative, to whose will I conform. And so in that posture, he treats the Holy Spirit. But I think the reason is the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. So if you badmouth Jesus, the Holy Spirit's still working on you. When you badmouth the Holy Spirit and drive him away, you've got no one to work on you. And if no one works on you, how are you going to repent? Now, a little, a little Steve Bauer personal theology those of us with children, you know, who aren't where we want them to be spiritually. If your child is pushing away the Holy Spirit, you can pray to God and say, please bug them with your Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> and then the Holy Spirit can go to your child and bug them and they're saying, I told you to get away. And the Holy Spirit can say, well, I'm doing it because your mom asked me. <laughs> I'm doing it because your dad asked me. They gave me permission. And so I think part of intercessory prayer is us giving God the permission to keep working on people, in a sense, in our name, mm -hmm. when the person is trying to reject them. Wow. <clears throat> Who's next? So, and I think you, we had a sister here with another question, oh. so we'll get her after you. You, you said earlier that um, according to the non- or anti-Trinitarians, they say that they, their, their framework is built around God begot Jesus. Right. Which we understand... As a singular begetting, right. not like the creed. Right. And we understand that the word begotten is just unique. So... Not quite... Well, the, the only begotten language comes from unique. Okay, okay. Yeah, as opposed to the psalm where today I have begotten you, that right. is a begotten language, but it's a metaphor. So. so my question is, in terms of begotten, the, the, the understanding of the non-Trinitarians or anti-Trinitarians is that begotten is not created, then what is begotten? How do they define begotten if it's not created? Because if, if, if Jesus hasn't always been here, and God the Father, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm struggling. What if, if it's I, not created? What I is? struggle too. <laughs> um, I find it to be a, a self-contradictory set of statements. Um, in a crude way, begotten is almost, almost like an amoeba splitting. So it's not birthed and it's not sexually reproduced, you know. But this thing proceeds out and breaks off, except for them, yeah, for them it becomes an independent being. But then when you challenge them on that, uh, they'll say that somehow Christ was hidden in the Father eternally and then just brought forth. 
and the bringing forth is the begetting, okay, but then when you make the analogy that um, um, Eve was in Adam and then brought out, that just doesn't work with the biblical text. Uh, and so that's where it gets uh, trouble. So they're trying to recognize that Christ is not created in the traditional sense of creating, yet they need him to be begotten to have this somewhat lesser status, and there's a certain incoherence to it that um, they don't seem to get. Uh, and hence, when I ask them, several of them, if the Father precedes the Son in existence, and they say yes, but then they turn around and say, well, this Son was eternally hidden in the Father, and they probably would take a text like all these, Levi was in the loins of Abraham. And so Christ would be somehow in the Father the way Levi was in Abraham kind of a thing maybe, but it just, it gets incoherent quickly. Uh, it gets incoherent quickly. Was our sister next or is she? My question actually is not so far from that. When you were making your lecture, you were using the term eternally begotten. And I didn't know what that meant. What is eternally, is it a verb? Is it an adjective? It's the eternal begetting of the Son. And this is from the creed. Mm -hmm. So in order to get Jesus to be of the same divine substance as the Father, they had to have him begotten by the Father philosophically. But if you're begotten, you have a beginning. But if you're God, you can't have a beginning. So what they came up with to solve that dilemma is that Christ has, is in the process of being begotten eternally. You know, it's, in other words, he is continually coming out of the Father's being and attached to the Father's being. And does that make sense to you? <laughs> I mean, there's a philosophical logic to it, but and then they have the Holy Spirit eternally proceeding out of those two, so it can be of the same substance of this way. So you have a begetting that has always been in process that's never had a beginning and will never have an end. That's the eternal begetting. This is where Ellen White, following her husband, says, in Christ was life original, and then these two key words, unborrowed and underived. Because the eternal begetting, ultimately Christ is deriving his being out of the Father, even though it's viewed as eternal. And the Holy Spirit is deriving his being out of the other two, even though it's eternal. And all of this gymnastics is so that they're all a single substance to thwart Arius, that it's just a similar substance. And the whole thing is in Greek philosophical land and not in scripture land. I see, so when we're using the word, or when you were lecturing with that term, that is a term that is associated to the creed. To the creeds. It's an eternal begetting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's not eternally begotten, he is eternally being begotten. Okay, okay, <clears throat> all right. He's eternally in this process. Uh, and, uh, and so um, it was interesting. See, now you get into problems. But Our pioneers saw this idea that the three members of the Godhead are literally a single substance. They're not three of the same substance. They are literally a single substance expressing itself in three persons. So that's why they misunderstood the Trinity as more of a three-headed God. And that's why they tended to understand it more modalistically that we have one substance which they treated more as one person. And therefore, Jesus' Father are manifestations of this one person. And they felt that diminished the individuality and personality of Jesus, which they saw in the Bible. So therefore, this modalistic misunderstanding is clearly not biblical. Uh, and so you have a partial misunderstanding of the creed, and then I don't, they don't like this eternal begetting where he's deriving. Um, a Catholic would say our position is tritheism. You got three separate gods, a Catholic theologian, I think, uh, because we don't have this proceeding 
out that links them into one single substance. We, we emphasize the three independent, eternal. And we would say that their oneness is more in some kind of, of um, spiritual um, harmonious based on John 17, where God wants, Christ said that we would be one the way he and his father are one. And clearly he's not talking about ontological oneness of essential nature because we're all essential nature human. You know, we're already one in that sense, but we can be divided in many other ways. Uh, he's looking at the oneness of purpose, the oneness of goals, the oneness of relation, uh, like the marriage oneness. And so I see the oneness of the Trinity more in those terms than in substance. But the result is the hardcore creedalist is probably going to accuse me that you're a tritheist. You believe in three gods. No, I believe in one God. He expresses himself this way. Your explanation goes beyond the scripture. I have to accept it as given, and I can't explain it. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try again. Uh, so John starts off with, in the beginning, there was God, and the word was with God, right? And then the word was God. Yeah, and that with is key, because it shows yes. two different beings. Yes, because syncing that up with us being made in God's image, our words have the power of life and death, correct? So that's it. But in a greater scale, I mean, we're talking about God. God creates with his word, and the word is Jesus Christ, and the word was with God. So us, with our words, they are with us in a smaller sense as before we even create, before we even say them. We can't create with the words, but we say them there with us since we're not eternal and we don't have the power to create, they're just with us, like on it. And now God, on a greater scale, the word was with God, which is Jesus Christ, with God. But then when he brought forth the word, it was already there. It's been eternal. And then somehow the Holy Spirit is synced in there. Uh, it's a statement, I guess. Okay. And then the other part, because I can go into Proverbs. I like to study Proverbs a lot. So I, I have a million trillion things going on in my head right now. But, but to sync it up with, uh, you know, God, uh, Jesus wasn't created. He was always there. The word was with God. That's the part right there. It was with God. Before he even brought forth the word to create through wisdom. And, and it, it was with And him. in Proverbs 8, this is where... The Lord possessed or had me before the creation. I was already there. Um, uh, fits that. And then Paul, he precedes all things and so forth. And so, yes, the New Testament puts Jesus as the unmade maker. Uh, I'll just say a quick word about word. Uh, in the Old Testament, God speaks and it was. John may have also been picking up off of the Greek idea that the logos or word was the organizing principle that drives the cosmos and appealing to a Greek audience, Christ is that organizing uh, principle that way. So there's, it may be both and a mix of Hebrew and Greek metaphor in one fell swoop there. Uh, I will make one uh, perhaps dangerous comment. Um, Genesis, it's very clear, God can speak and things come into existence. And as you rightly said, I can speak, but it doesn't bring anything into existence. Uh, at least physically, okay? Uh, I can't say, let there be a chair, and, you know, let there be water and so forth. I find it interesting today that as part of the cultural milieu now, we want to give people the power to speak, to literally change who they are. And if they say that they're X, then we're all supposed to agree that they're X regardless of any you know, factor. And so we are scribing to human this I speak and it is that we should be only gods. Um, we cannot speak ourselves into something we are not. Amen. However, however, we do have to grapple with social interpretations of what that means to be whatever this is, and that is biblically open for discussion. Uh, uh, I think they have a valid complaint that society may too narrowly define certain things and so forth, but 
you have this, I speak, therefore I am. And ooh, this is starting to feel a lot like a false creation narrative uh, uh, to me from a theological perspective. From a grace perspective, of course, I have to meet people where they are and start with them where they are and be gracious and kind and, and not challenge unnecessarily while I win confidence. But in the background, you think you make certain observations this way. Got one, last, one on, last question over here. On that same vein about the speaking or what have you, you know, when Paul says, as a man thinketh, so is he, I mean, can we, is that not correct? Maybe I think I'm, that's in Proverbs, but go ahead. Okay, well, yeah, so as a man thinketh, so is he, but do we not speak things into existence? I'm not talking about like a physical chair, but I'm saying uh, our words can manifest into our lives. Is that? We can speak maybe certain conditions and emotions into existence. Mm -hmm. uh, we allow judges and pastors to speak marriages into existence. But if God hadn't created marriage, I don't know how far we would go. But that's a limited power. We can't speak things into existence the way God can. And particularly, we can't speak reality into existence. Reality is reality, and we have to speak within reality. But within reality, there are a few things, especially emotional or statuses, that we can speak into existence. But I just can't go out and speak a well or a river or something like that into existence nor can I speak into existence in our created order that two plus two will now equal five. Uh, well, I'm referring to like conditions in our lives. But if we dwell. But even when we speak, it usually has to be followed by an action. We just don't raw speak and it happens. We speak a goal, then we get to work accomplishing the goal, uh, you know, that way. So that's, um, um, there's clearly, on the same time though, you are picking up on the Old Testament theme that there is power in speech. It's not an unlimited power like God's, but there is power in speech. And so the old sticks and stones may make my bones, but words may never hurt me. Words do hurt, okay? They may not hurt as much as a broken bone, but they still hurt. And so, this was where naming your child had a bit of sense of power to it uh, or commemoration to it uh, in the Old Testament, you know, et cetera. And, and so, um, names, because name is tied to reputation too. And so, in that sense, names can create certain limited conditions. It also can destroy, right? Gossip can destroy reputation uh, and so forth. But in the sense of creating something out of nothing, we can't do that. We can't change the nature of reality by disagreeing with it and speaking. Uh, within that reality, we have limited powers to articulate and speak. And as I say, I pronounce you husband and wife. Uh, there's a case where speech does change something, but it only changes uh, a legal relational status because of social recognition uh, you know, and so forth. Uh, I had, <laughs> I had a guy who was my head elder in the middle of a major nuclear meltdown of a church. And finally, he and his wife confessed to me that they actually weren't legally married. They've been married for close to 20 years, quote unquote. They went out into the wilderness, pledged themselves to each other before God without witnesses and came back and said, we're married and live faithfully thereafter. But that's the last thing I need is my head elder to get found out on this one in a, in a nuclear meltdown church, right? You know, uh, et cetera. So they spoke, but without the other recognitions, it didn't carry the weight. So we had a little private ceremony with one person in the church who knew the situation and was keeping quiet. And I did some speaking and with witnesses and signing papers, then my words meant something. So there's even limits on that front as to how powerful.
And that's why he needs to be full deity uh, so that we're not dealing with a creaturely, we are dealing directly with God himself when we deal with Christ. Amen. Have you been blessed? One of the things that I am confident in is that the position that has been carved out by the Seventh-day Adventist Church and that has been articulated by Dr. Bauer is a correct position. If I, as I've had discussions with others who um, are not of our denomination, they don't necessarily agree with some of how we present the Trinity, but they understand and agree that, um, <laughs> you know, what they said is, oh, you Adventists have a minority view, but it's an accepted view. Um, they recognize us as a form of Trinitarian. Right. Maybe a little alternate, but we're still Thanks. Trinitarian. <laughs> one, one of the things I would encourage each of us to do, um, you got the handouts, use those handouts, um, you know, be like the Bereans, the Church of Thessalonica, you know, study, uh, research it, you know, solidify it for yourselves. Um, he, here is a reality. A reality is this. At the end of time, every man, every woman has to give an account for himself or herself. Amen? Amen. Um, God, listen to me carefully, has allowed us to build relationships and come into churches and denominations, amen, uh, to help us along the way with that account. Are y'all listening to me? This is a purposeful statement. I'm, not, I'm just going to let you know it's a purposeful statement. Do not let anybody tell you. Listen to what I'm about to say. You have to study for yourself, and then they feed you a bunch of stuff to study for yourself. Are y'all listening to me? If somebody says to you, study for yourself, by the way, here's all the stuff you need to study. Are you studying for yourself or are you taking from them what they want you to study? Are you listening to me? If you pray, you ask God, God will give you resources. There are enough out there. Are you listening to me? Dr. Bauer has given you resources. Others will suggest to you resources. Study. Amen. Study. He studied, I've studied, I'm settled, he's settled, a lot of you are settled. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Study. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> I know I've got you You're welcome. Here. You're just sitting there like, what is he saying? Amen. <laughs> just hang with me. <laughs> We're going to uh, stand for our benediction. The, the hour is late. And thank all of you who stayed by and we ate. We ate well. Hallelujah. Amen. Those of you who didn't stay by, you probably ate, but you didn't eat well. <laughs> Amen. We ate well, and it was good. Um, we know where you are should we need you. And uh, the mental health sermon will be coming our way. Um, I'll do my schedule way out, man. I'm like done for the year. I got to get you next year. That's fine. It's, I'm out too. So. Amen. <laughs> he left me hanging. <laughs> he still oh, left. I, I didn't see the gesture. I was, I was looking up here, not down here. <laughs> That's on tape. Uh, Father, we want to thank you for allowing us an opportunity to gather this, uh, this whole day. Um, we have been um, enlightened. We have been challenged. Um, we have been even provoked in a positive way. Uh, May you bless us uh, not to just be determined to um, let this just float away, but help us each to do what the scripture says, study to show ourselves approved, workmen who need not be ashamed. Help us to um, rightly divide the word. Amen. Amen. Also, Lord, uh, our prayer is this, um, that you would help us to understand the nature of confusion, and give us keen eyes, a discerning spirit, so that we can see and recognize confusion right away. And it's our prayer, Lord, that you would uh, help us to avoid it. 
Help us, keep us uh, from falling into a trap. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, also, bless us as we go and bring us back at the next appointed hour. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance on you. Give you peace. Give you peace.